to stand. Please stand. We're singing that there is joy in the house of the Lord. Do you have joy this morning? No dread. Well, let's lift our voice and put your hands together and let's worship the King of Kings. Come on. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Come on, sing it out. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Come on, give it up for Jesus one more time. Well, we praise the Lord that there is truly joy in the house today. There's so much joy that so many people want to get into the house of the Lord to experience it. So we need to do the Northridge nudge. And if you don't know what that means, that means that we need you to look toward the center of your row. And you may see some empty seats. Please squeeze in toward the center so that those that want to experience the joy in the house of the Lord are able to do so with us. I'll give you a moment to do that. Thank you, Lord. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. 
and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. And we want to continue in this atmosphere of praise and worship and thanksgiving. And we'll do that by receiving an offering. And we give as an expression of thanks to God for who he is and all that he has provided for us. He's already been so generous. And we have an opportunity to show our generosity. If you're a guest or you're a visitor here, we're so glad you decided to join us today. But we want you to know that this part of the service is not for you. We want you to feel no obligation to give. But for the rest of us, we want to be a part of what God is doing here. But before we give, let's pray. Father in heaven, you are a good God. You are faithful and you are true. Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for the price you paid. Thank you for your sacrifice. Mm, it's because of your love that we can truly experience joy. We can come in with our issues and our pain and our sadness, with our shame, and leave with joy. Lord, we know that this offering will be used to further your gospel here locally and around the world. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Hey Northridge, my name is Ryan and I'm the middle school pastor here. I wanna take just a couple minutes to let you know about some different things we have coming up here at Northridge. First up, we have Discover Northridge. If you are new to our church or just wanna know more about who we are, where we've been and where we're going, we'd love for you to be a part of this three-week class that takes place May 7th, 14th, and 21st during the 916 service in Brighton and the 1116 service here in Plymouth. To sign up or to get more info, head to northridgechurch.com slash discover. Next up, we have our marriage retreat. We have an amazing weekend planned, April 28th and 29th from 6 to 9 p.m. on Friday and 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday. So if you're a married couple or pursuing marriage, come have a fun time together, learn more about God's design for your marriage, and I promise it's gonna be a great weekend. To sign up or to get more info, go to northridgechurch.com slash marriage. Next up, we have retirement roots. A lot of people don't realize that the Bible actually has a lot to say about retirement and leaving a legacy. So if you are retired or thinking about retirement, come be a part of Retirement Roots this Saturday, April 29th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. For more information, go to northridgechurch.com slash stewardship. For our last announcement, I think we need a woman. So here's Marissa, our social media director. Hey, women in Northridge. Can we cut? Can we uh, get something for her to stand on? Oh, yeah, that's better. Hey, women in Northridge. Coming back this year is our women's conference. Come on May 12th and 13th with the already over 200 registered women to worship, hear a word, be encouraged, and so much more. This is a weekend you don't want to miss. So head to northridgechurch.com slash women and grab your spot today. And that's what's happening, happening around Northridge. <laughs>
Hallelujah. Can we give Jesus praise? Can we give our Lord and Savior the praise that he deserves? What a mighty God. What an awesome Savior we serve. What a joy it is to be back here at Northridge. I was sharing at uh, one of the earlier services that I'm probably entering into a season of mourning because I actually enjoy the winter. I'm sorry. I fr and so the fact that the summer is coming, I should be wearing all black. But God is so good and uh, so grateful for his goodness and so thankful for this series, uh, particularly about encounters and our prayer is that those of you that are far from God, uh, those that are investigating uh, this thing called Christianity, this uh, person named Jesus, would maybe find in this series, uh, and maybe particularly today, an opportunity to encounter Jesus. I, I rarely do this, but there's a song that uh, is just indicative of part of my journey that I'm gonna tie into the message today. So I'm not a singer, I'm a preacher, so if I sing the wrong note, please show grace. Uh, don't start heckling and booing me, but. Um, this is the song. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God oh I will sing of the goodness of of God. How many of y'all know the Lord is good? How many of y'all know the goodness of the Lord? How many of y'all know that he's been good your entire life, even when you couldn't see him? Well, you all, as we lean into this text and as we lean into this Emmaus Road story, my prayer is that we would maybe have a fresh revelation of encountering God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the worship that's been lifted to your name. We thank you so much for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light on our path. We cannot stumble. We cannot be unsure of our steps when your word directs us. Holy Spirit, be the teacher. We'll be so careful to give all glory and honor where it belongs, and that is to you, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, there is a scripture found in Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. Luke 24, God's, the gospel according to Luke uh, chapter 24, beginning at verse 13, and it reads, And behold, that very day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had occurred. And while they were conversing and discussing together, Jesus himself caught up with them and was already accompanying them. But their eyes were held so that they did not recognize him. And he said to them, what is this discussion that you're exchanging, throwing back and forth between yourselves as you walk along? And they stood still looking sad and downcast. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Do you alone dwell as a stranger in Jerusalem and not know the things that have occurred there in these days? And he said to them, What kind of things? And they said to him, About Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in work and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers gave him up to be sentenced to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who would redeem and set Israel free. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things occurred. And moreover, some women of our company astounded us and drove us out of our senses. They were at the tomb early in the morning, but did not find his body. And they returned saying that he had even, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. So some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said, but uh, him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, sluggish in mind, dull of perception, and slow to heart to believe and to adhere and to trust and rely on everything that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary 
and essentially fitting that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer all these things before entering into his glory, his majesty and splendor? Then beginning with Moses and throughout all the prophets, he went on explaining and interpreting to them in all the scriptures the things concerning and referring to himself. Then they drew nigh or near the village to uh, which they were going, and he acted as if he would go further. But they urged and insisted, saying to him, Remain with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And it occurred that as he reclined at table with them, he took a, a, a loaf of bread and praised God and gave thanks and asked a blessing and then broke it and was giving it to them when their eyes were instantly open and they clearly recognized him and he vanished and departed invisibly. And they said to one another, were not our hearts greatly moved and burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and as he opened and explained to us the sense of the scriptures. In 1977, uh, one of my favorite directors and uh, producers, uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, wrote and directed a blockbuster film entitled Close Encounter of the Third Kind. The title is derived actually from uh, J. Allen Hynek's classification of a close encounter with those entities that are other than earthly, in which a human being interacts, has observations of these supernatural or these extraterrestrial beings. Fascination still exists around this subject. I even found out that a few days ago uh, in our, our Congress uh, that uh, some of our military officials were interacting and talking about whether or not UFOs really exist. We seem to be fascinated by having encounters with things that are otherworldly. But many of us have had encounters with things that are not otherworldly, but things that have transformed us as we've encountered uh, along the way those people. Uh, several of those instances uh, come to mind. One of them, a gentleman by the name of Ronald Rubenstein, my first boss in elementary school, who taught me the value of hard work and the value of expanding my mind and I can do anything that I be believed I could do in my heart. But also Sister Madonna, who also in elementary school, uh, taught me the importance of caring for the least of these and also taught me how to play the acoustic guitar. And then uh, I, I had a chance to encounter a transfer student who came into my high school in the fall of 1982, who uh, I would fall in love with and later call my wife, Nancy. These encounters you all have changed my life, have impacted me. The person that you see standing before you is directly connected to those encounters, but there's been no encounter that has been more greatly impacting than the encounter that I've had with Jesus Christ. There's been no situation, there's been no meeting, there's been no interaction with anything, anybody, any circumstance that has been more changing and transforming than my interaction with Jesus. So I want to talk today from the subject, a close encounter of the Jesus kind. A close encounter of the Jesus kind. I want to talk from three, three particular points. Close but unrecognizable. Close when disappointed. And close when the breaking reveals. So just three things, close but unrecognizable, close when disappointed, and close when the breaking reveals. And it all comes from the text. And so you all, we find in verse 13 uh, uh, these words, and behold, that very day the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking to each other about all the things that have occurred. This is on the other side of the resurrection, you all, and we're on the uh, other side of Easter Sunday, and, and we remember that indeed Jesus did get up, but many people were doubting this resurrection. Many people had not had firsthand encounters with the resurrected Savior, so there was a lot of doubt and a lot of uncertainty, especially for those who had followed Jesus and had given themselves uh, to his cause. And these individuals who are called disciples on this road, uh, on their way home to Emmaus, were those individuals that found themselves in a position where they were disappointed, they were downcast, and they were broken. It says as they were talking about the things that had occurred, something happened. 
uh, it says in verse 15, while they were conversing and discussing together, Jesus himself caught up with them and was already accompanying them. You all, as they were questioning what happened, as they were questioning how things went down, the Bible says that Jesus comes alongside of them and now walks on the path with them in the midst of their questions. Let me just say to those that are listening both in live and, uh, and, and on, in, on, online, uh, if you have questions, it's not intimidating to Jesus. If there's something that you are concerned about, if there are things that you don't totally understand, if there are things that you actually say, you know what, I'm not sure if I even believe that. Uh, my, my intellect can't wrap my mind around that. It's not too big for Jesus to not walk with you in the midst of your questions. I'm so grateful that Jesus modeled in this text that even though you may be discouraged, even though you may be despondent, even though things may not have worked out the way that you thought that they would work out, Jesus is still willing to walk with you even in your doubt and your uncertainty certainty. You all, the story of my salvation and the story of my journey uh, to salvation and, and encountering God is a very, very interesting one. I grew up in the church. My mom uh, raised me as a single parent mom. I have no siblings. Uh, and my mom uh, made sure that every Sunday I went to church. It didn't matter whether or not I liked church or not, I was going to church. And then she would tell me, and you need to look like you're enjoying it. Now, I don't know what that means. How, how, how in the world do you look like you're enjoying something that you don't enjoy? Well, I, I figured it out because my mother would often pop me in the face if my face did not align with joy. So, so I didn't know what they were talking about. I had no clue what was going on, but I was always like, and so you all, I grew up in church, and I grew up with a relationship with church, but not a relationship with Jesus. And there may be some of you all that are listening right now that that might be part of your story where you've grown up maybe around church, around Christians, maybe even grown up in church, but there's been no personal relationship, no personal encounter. My mom committed to education, wanting to make sure that I got the best education that I could, often worked multiple jobs, ensuring that I could go to the best schools. Went to private grammar school, but ended up accepted in a Jesuit prep school in high school. That's where I met the love of my life. But it's also where I ended up uh, getting the tools that I needed to get, get into uh, some great universities. And so I got accepted full scholarship to Notre Dame University. But I chose to go to Northwestern because uh, of a much higher purpose. My girlfriend was going to Northwestern. <laughs> True story. And so I went to Northwestern, you all, and, and, and you all, being at Northwestern was a big deal. I'm from the hood. I'm from the south side of Chicago. And here I am now at one of the, the elite schools of America, had a, a job guaranteed at the Northern Trust Bank upon graduation, beautiful girl on my arm. So all of the boxes were checked. How many of you all have had boxes that you've checked? Uh, I, I've graduated. I've gotten this house. I've achieved this. I've achieved that. Check, check, check. But I was empty. I was not happy. Things were still not right. And there's some of you that are listening right now, the boxes are checked, but there's no joy. So uh, it was after a toga party. <laughs> Can you imagine a black dude in a toga? That was me. It was after a toga party that I began to ask some deep questions. I don't know if because I was wearing a toga and I felt philosophical, uh, but I started asking myself the question, like, if these are the boxes that are supposed to make me happy, why aren't they? If these are the attainments that are supposed to make people say that you have achieved the greatest things in life, why am I not feeling that joy or that sense of accomplishment? Went back to my dorm, changed clothes, and left out and uh, went to kind of have a conversation with God. And I, I stood out on a bridge at Northwestern and I said, okay, God, you know everything and you know where I'm at. You know I struggle with depression. You know I struggle with low self-esteem. If this is how life is going to pan out, I don't even know if I want to live it. And so if you are who you claim that you are, if you are who you say that you are, I'm genuinely saying, do what you do, but I need to encounter you. I need to meet you. And about one o'clock in the morning, Jesus Christ on that bridge gloriously came into my life and saved me and changed my life forever. I'm telling you all. So I went back to my dorm 
My roommate, Stuart Feldman, uh, i never forget. Uh, uh, and by the way, you know, as an unsaved guy in college, you do know that my room reflected where I was on my journey. So uh, everything on the wall that I had, all the posters, they were not Jesus posters. They were not God-honoring posters. So I took all the posters down, tore them up. And young people, you won't understand anything about this because long before streaming and long before MP3s and all that stuff, and even long before CDs, there was a thing called cassette tapes. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And so I had some mixtapes that I also knew did not honor Jesus. And so I took the tapes that I owned and started snapping them each in half. My roommate thought I was having a mental breakdown. He really did. Uh, but I wasn't. Jesus was doing a work in me. I found a Bible that my Sunday school teacher had given to me uh, as I graduated from uh, grammar school that I never read. I opened it up and began reading it from cover to cover. This love letter of God explaining to me his love for his people, even though uh, we had sinned and we had fallen away from his grace and, well, not his grace, but fallen away from fellowship because of sin, and he's reaching out to us, and I found so much life and so much joy, and really, even when I got to the book of Romans, I'm like, ah, so that's what happened on the bridge, because I felt so sinful and so dirty and so unworthy, but instantly I felt this love telling me it's okay. Oh, that's what I did. I confessed with my sin and believed in my heart that Jesus is Lord. That's what I did. I got saved. And I was excited about this revelation. So at the end of the book, I said, you know what? I need to tell people about this. So I went to the student union and I asked for a room that I could reserve uh, for Bible study. Never read a Bible study. Wasn't a teacher. Didn't know anything about that. But I said, I just want to share with students what I have learned uh, these past few days. So for the next few days, you all, the group grew from five to 10 to about 100 students that were coming every single day to hear the word of God. And I remember saying, I think I could do this all the time. And God says, and you will. <laughs> and I said, okay, this is exciting. So I called my mom. This is my mama. Mama, guess what? I got to tell you what has happened in my freshman year at Northwestern. Tell me, baby, what are you learning? What are you? I said, no, no, mom, I got saved. She said, baby, that is the greatest news in the world. I've been praying for you that you would come to know Jesus. Thank God. I said, but mama, that's not it. I read the whole Bible from cover to cover. She said, baby, that is so good. I said, but mama, that's not it. I rented a room because after I read the Bible, I wanted to tell other students. And I, and I have a Bible study that I've been leading. There have been about 100 students coming every day. She said, baby, what a blessing. And I said, but mama, guess what? I'm going to preach the gospel. She said, baby, you know what? The bank needs preachers. You know, the financial institutions need people that have ethics. I said, no, 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 mom. I'm not going to go into finance and business. I'm just going to be a preacher full time. Click. My mom hung up the phone, you all. I'm calling back. She's not answering. The next day, she's not answering. Realized my mom was poor, and she had spent all her money for me to become a financier, and now I'm talking about preaching the gospel. She's like, oh, no, I'm not answering this call. And I remember saying to myself, all I got is my mom in this world, but if I've got to choose between my mother and the call of God, I choose the call. Later on, my mother, of course, came around, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, she would always be in the front row wherever I would preach, and she's like, that's my baby preaching right there. And so now that she's at home, I know she's looking down saying, that's my baby down there preaching. She was my number one fan. <laughs> the encounter with Jesus was filled with a lot of steps marked with a lot of uncertainty. And for some of you all that are listening right now, you believe that maybe encountering God would be filled without struggle, filled without maybe questions, maybe these encounters that you're expecting to have with God would be full of, of no kind of resistance, but that's not always the case. So I want you to see what happened in the text. The Bible says that as they were walking, Jesus comes and accompanies them. But verse 16, look at this. But their eyes were held so that they did not recognize him. I submit to you all that there are times in your life that the Lord has been walking with you, but you've not recognized him. There have been moments that God has showed up and you ascribed it to something else other than him because you just couldn't recognize him. I, I, I submit that God has always been with you. He's always been walking with you. He's always been leading you. Remember that car accident that you were in? The car was mangled and you came out. It wasn't luck. It was God. 
There've been moments in your life that God has brought supply and brought provision for you and you attribute it to, oh, I forgot that, that rebate or I forgot, no, 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 it was God's provision. The alarm system that you have in your house, it, that's not what's kept you safe. It has been God's protection. I believe that there've been moments in our lives that God has been walking with us and God has been showing up in our lives, but we have been held from recognizing him. Just because we don't recognize him doesn't mean he's not present. Hear that. Just because you cannot see him, it doesn't mean you cannot believe that he is present. There have been moments, you all, where God has shown up in your life, but you have not known it. And as a result, you thought that God didn't care. You thought that God was unconcerned. You thought that God maybe uh, had abandoned you or maybe was never with you at all. And for many people, one of the reasons why they resist encountering Jesus or resist wanting to encounter him is they ask questions like this. God, where were you when X happened? God, why weren't you here in this way? And because we could not see him and because we could not trace him, we find it difficult to trust him. And my question to you is, are you able to praise him when you cannot trace him? Are you able to give him glory when you cannot see him? Are you able to worship him when things are not okay? Listen, some of us want to be delivered out of trouble, but God does not always deliver us out of trouble. Sometimes he delivers us in the trouble. Some, y'all, remember, y'all remember Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, right? The three Hebrew boys are in a fiery furnace, right? And you know their prayers. Don't, we don't want to burn up. God, deliver us from the fire. Deliver us from the trial. Deliver us from the furnace. And God's answer is no, no, I'm not going to change your situation, but I'm going to change you in your situation. I'm not going to change your circumstance, but I'm going to change you in your circumstance. Now the Bible says that there's not just three, but there's now a fourth man and with them in the middle of the fire, and he looks like the Son of God. No, you're not out of the fire, but you're in it with Jesus doing the moonwalk. Don't tell me, God. God is able to be with you even when things look impossible. And there are people that are listening right now that are questioning the existence of God because your circumstance seems so dark. And these men, as they travel on this road, The Bible says, when Jesus looked at them and asked them, how are you feeling? What's going on? I love this next verse, verse 17. He said, what is this that you're discussing between yourselves? They stopped looking sad and downcast. I'm so grateful that God is a God of the sad and the downcast. For those right now whose hearts are heavy, For those right now who may even be angry, for those who might be disappointed, Jesus is walking with you, close but unrecognizable. But not only that, you all, he's sometimes close when we're disappointed. Look at verse 18. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, do you alone dwell as a stranger in Jerusalem and not know the things that have occurred there in these days. Uh, They were kind of throwing a little shade. Jesus, what kind of rock were you under, uh, sir? Because uh, everybody that was in Jerusalem knows what has happened. And he asked them, uh, what kind of things? You all, whenever Jesus or God asks a question, no, he's not asking it because he doesn't know. He's asking it because you don't know. Uh, uh, God tells uh, Adam, after Adam has sinned in the garden and now is sinful, uh, Adam, where are you? Uh, God knew where Adam was. Adam just didn't know where Adam was. And so now Jesus asked the question, uh, what are you What are you so disappointed about? What kind of things? And they said about Jesus of Nazareth. Now look at this. This is how they describe him. Who was a, what, prophet? mighty in work and word before God and all the people. So when they gave a description of what they thought Jesus of Nazareth was, no, not Messiah, no, not Son of God, a prophet, but a prophet that was mighty in work and word before God and the people. So their, listen, their view of him was not him. Their view of who they thought he was was not actually who he was. It explains it later. It says in verse 20, 
and how our chief priests and rulers gave him up to be sentenced to death and crucified him. Watch this now. But we were hoping that it was he who would redeem and set Israel free. Watch this now. We were hoping that Jesus would be the liberator of our cause. We were hoping that Jesus would finally be the Messiah that would finally put Rome in its place. Rome, this oppressive regime, this impressive, oppressive empire, caused taxation rates to be unreasonable, sometimes persecution and hardships. And so the, the people of God were like, you know, when we get our Messiah, he's going to handle Israel. Jesus didn't handle Israel. And so they were disappointed, listen, that the Jesus that they wanted him to be was not the Jesus that he was. And because of that, they chose to not accept the Jesus that he was. My question to you is this. Who are you making Jesus to be to fit your narrative? Who are you demanding that he be for your cause? And if he doesn't answer your prayers, answer them when you want it, how you want it, and the way you want it, you question his validity. I don't know if you're real if you don't answer my prayers the way I want it. How many of y'all have prayed some prayers, and in retrospect, you're glad that God did not answer that prayer? Come on, don't look at me in that tone of voice. How many of y'all, right? I, I, I'll say this, y'all. All right, so there was a moment that my wife and I just broke up for a little while. Just a little while. Just a little while. It was just a little while. A little while. It was in high school, right? A little while. And at that point, I'm like, man, I think I want that girl to be my girl. Uh, how many of y'all been back to your high school reunions? <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lord, for redeeming my mind. All right, so, so anyway, the girl that I thought I wanted to marry, Jesus of Nazareth, thank God that he did not hear my prayer. That girl does not look the way she looked at all. Listen, you all, what I'm saying is this. Many of us have prayed, right, and we've asked God to do things, but they were not the will of God for us. That was not the perfect plan of God for us. But for many of us, we've turned away from him because he's not shown up the way that we wanted him to. And we've actually chosen to not even follow him because he's not fit into our prescribed kind of box. And so these guys are disappointed in him because they say, well, we thought that he would finally be uh, the one that would actually redeem us from is from uh, the tyranny of Rome, and he has not done that. And so I don't know if this was the guy, but watch this. It says, but not only that, moreover, verse 30, 22. Uh, no, 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 verse 21, the second part of that. He says, besides all this, it is now the third day since these things occurred. So in addition to him not setting us free from Rome, it's now the third day. And they remembered him saying that on the third day, I will rise again. Now, they heard reports of it, but they've not encountered it themselves. So they now kind of give us the testimony about how they've heard these reports. Verse 22, and moreover, some women of our company astounded us and drove us even out of our senses. They were at the tomb early in the morning, but did not find his body. And they returned saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. So they said, we haven't seen him, but some women went to the tomb and they said that he was not there, but actually some angels were there that said he was alive. Uh, and then verse 24 is kind of funny, just shows you uh, that women were not just marginalized today, but they were marginalized then. So some of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found it just as the women said. <laughs> So now we got to send some men folk to verify that what these women said, you're right, just as you said it, you know. And so bottom line, uh, the report has come back that he's not there. They did not see him. And so because they could not see him, they did not believe him. We hope that he would redeem us from the tyranny of Rome, but we also hope that he would be resurrected. But where is he? They are disappointed. Jesus answers them, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe everything that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary and essentially fitting that Christ the Messiah should suffer all these things before entering into his glory, his majesty, and his splendor?
I love this part. Because Jesus now, still hidden from them, still unrecognizable, begins to explain to them the faulty nature of their premise. That yes, he was crucified. Yes, he died. But isn't it fitting that the Messiah would suffer before entering into glory? And so in this one moment, Jesus, hidden from their view and their understanding, gives them an understanding about the nature of Christ and really the nature of Christ's followers. He said, isn't it fitting that he suffered before entering into glory? And for many of us, part of the reasons why we run from encountering Jesus or maybe not recognize the encounter with Jesus, listen, is because the suffering, listen, the suffering tends to eclipse our revelation of his existence. And for some of us, listen, we think that suffering means that Jesus is not present. And if Jesus suffered and he is God, what makes you and I think that we are exempt from being in the midst of suffering too? We sing these songs like, I, uh, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart except for suffering. <laughs> right? So for many of us, we want Christianity without suffering. But if we actually want to follow in the footsteps of Christ and follow in the modeling of Christ, we know that he suffered and died before glory was found. The Bible says that I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings and then in the power of his resurrection. Is there anybody in this room that has suffered at any point? I came to let you know that is not the end of the story because that's Good Friday, but Easter Sunday is coming soon. Uh-huh. Let me walk you through this real quick. So I, I used to ask God, why would you allow me to be abused as a child? Not my mom, but why would you allow abuse to happen? Why would you allow depression to be the thing that marked the majority of my life? You see me on the stage as a energetic, positive preacher, but you don't know the dark nights of the soul. You don't know the times that I prayed for death. You don't know the times that I tried to take my life. I shared with you all before that I was in hospice, that something happened to me physiologically and I was in a situation where I was unable to speak, no bodily control of my bodily fluids, dying down to 90 or so pounds. Funeral plan. Pastor renting out an arena downtown Chicago for my funeral and telling my wife, we got to plan the funeral. And my wife said, he's not going to die. <coughs> he said, well, you know, the whole grief process begins with, you know, doubt or, you know, with, you know. That. She says, no, I understand all that. But God told my husband we're supposed to go to Detroit to start a church and we're still in Chicago. So either God lied or my husband's getting up. So I don't believe God lied. So my husband's getting up. This is our 20th year anniversary. Watch this. So why would God allow me to be abused? Why would God allow me to have depression? So that I'm able to minister to somebody who is depressed and somebody who's been abused. What the devil intended for evil, God meant it for good to deliver a whole lot of people. Don't you think that the devil has more power than God? You're still here. You're still here. You're still here. You might have a lamp, but you're still here. Oh, my God. All right. I got one minute and 37 seconds. Mm, 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 mm. Let me just tell you something. I don't understand Christians who cannot get a little excited when you think about how much God has done for your crazy butt. You should be... Is there anybody here? God has been good to you. Then let the redeemed of the Lord. Say something. Clap your hands, O oh ye people, and shout. Glory to God. 
to God. Okay, last point, last point, last point. Uh, Jesus is getting ready to keep going. And the, and the guy said, no, no, no. They urged him, stay. Last thing. Don't let Jesus pass you by right now. Don't, don't let this moment where God's presence is here, let him pass you by. They urged him. They didn't know him. But there's something about him. Stay. Stay. The Bible says that he decided to stay, have dinner with them, reclining at the dinner table that was their custom. He takes bread and he takes it and he blesses it. He gives thanks, breaks it, and he gives it. And the moment that he breaks it and he gives it, their eyes are open. And they, re they realize this is Jesus. Instantly, he vanishes. Isn't this something? We want to see you. And the moment that we see you, you leave us. Because, watch this, I don't want you to walk by sight. I want you to walk by faith. I want you to continue to serve me even when you can't see me. And so the Bible says that when Jesus left their midst and vanished, they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he shared the word of God with us along the way. And I just want to end with this, you all. I, I, I thank God that right now somebody feels your heart burning within you as the word of God has been shared along the way. And I want to encourage you when service is over and there's no preacher and there's no worship team and there's no church uh, building around you, you don't need to keep your burning heart uh, quiet. You can be in Kroger aisle three and give him a praise. Don't, don't look at me like that. You, you can be in 12 Oaks Mall and think about the goodness of God and give God a praise. You can be driving on 96 and think about how good God has been to you and give him a praise and encounter with Jesus when we cannot recognize him, when we are di dis disappointed and when we are broken, it still reveals that he's still always been with us. For those of you that are far from God, all you got to do is simply say, Jesus, I need you. If you're listening right now in person or online, all you got to do is say, you know what, Jesus, I'm not God. I'm not you. I've had bad things happen. I've got a lot of questions. I'm even angry. But you know what? I have enough sense to know that I've not traveled this low road alone. You've been with me. I give my life to you. And if you do that, and if you've done that, heaven celebrates the fact that you have come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There's no greater encounter that you'll ever have. Text to Northridge 31616. If you just made that decision, text Northridge to 31616. And as the worship team comes to lead us further in worship, don't you dare be silent. Don't you dare not lift your hands. Don't you dare not get engaged because encountering Jesus means I will praise him even when I cannot see him.
Well, I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that we got to encounter Jesus this weekend. Did anyone encounter Jesus? That we have a God that won't fail us, that no matter what happens this week, we can stand firm in the promise of who he is. And so with that in mind, maybe you're in the room and maybe you're walking through something, maybe you're praying about something. We would love to join you with that. So every week after our uh, service, we have our prayer team available. They're gonna be available on the sides of the rooms. They'll have lanyards on, but we would love to join you in praying with whatever you're praying about. Second thing is maybe you're new to Northridge. Maybe you've started coming through Easter or beginning of the year and you're like, how do I make this place feel like family? And we would love to help you get connected. We'd love to, to tell you about the different ministries and groups we have going on. And so we have a space right outside of door two uh, called the glass room. And we have some volunteers in there that would love to connect with you. would love to help you take next steps. And then last but not least, next week, we have Pastor Pete Wilson back in the house. We're going to be continuing our series on encounters, but we love you. We hope you have a great week.